This is the final video for the course, Technology and Values, and it's the only one recorded in New York. It is the 28th of July, though I expect it will be after midnight before this is posted. This lecture takes up elements from my ch chapter in Oshin Lali's Sustainability in the Anthropocene, Philosophical Essays on Renewable Technology. It's a great book collection, a lot of uh, positive takes on the idea, as you can see from the subtitle of Renewable Technology. I'm talking weather. And there's an epigraph, a tiny epigraph from SDS. Alarin from Wetter, wir nicht. Everyone talks about the weather, not us. And you can see Marx and Engels and, of course, Lenin and uh, Peter Sloterdijk, just a little younger. Sloterdijk uses the language of atmoterrorism in his book, Terror from the Air. Yet, although the example Sloterdijk chooses for his analysis, that's the inception of gas warfare in World War I, is more than a century old, his analysis has found little resonance among his fellow scholars. Indeed, we philosophers even have our work cut out for us just to catch the illusion to Lucy Rigorize, Heidegger, and the forgetting of air, just as Sloterdijk mentions her meditations on yoga and breath, l'oubli de l'air, beautiful title in French. What occasions philosophical discussions of this kind? Who can know? It seems so oblique, so evanescent, transparent, translucent. Who remembers Anaximenes who wrote on air? Until COVID-19, talk of breath was an elliptical, intimate affair, and to a certain extent, it still is. Thus, some point out that masks make it hard to breathe. And personal experience can confirm that. But experts, what kind of experts you can ask that, insist that one should ignore one's own sense of suffocation, difficulty. And on the face of it, that's an odd assertion. It's surely only the individual struggling to breathe has the right to speak about such things, only they would know. In Minimum Moralia, Theodore Adorno, alludes to what he describes as the shame of not only needing to breathe, but not less of finding that one is still able to breathe, as this testifies to what is a survivor's culpability given the gas chambers. For his part, Sotodike reflects on what he calls atmospheric explication, inviting us to review what we continue to take for granted that's where this comes in. Where Sloterdijk becomes uncanny, however, it'll be where he crosses certain lines by reminding us that the U.S. use of drones under Obama and ongoing through Trump and the current administration, which you can think of atmospheric explication, cannot but be regarded as terrorist practice, quite by definition. Whether militarization is on the same continuum and Sloterdijk knows how the names we give or do not give to things works in the media. He was for many years a journalist, and to this extent, the backstory to all fake news concerns how what is fit to print, what's news, gets into print. And thus Sloterdijk offers an archaeology of what silenced in plain sight, as it were. Thus he explains that in his own way, he's explaining his reading between Adorno and Heidegger. Adorno advanced the doctrine of end framing, das Gäste, which in his work is called the existing das Bettstehende, according to which there's a continually self-corroborating play of reciprocal fixations and distortions at work between a subject that is egoistically callous and calculates everything and an object world that has been tailored to this subject. That's the quote. Bruno Latour has for some time been telling us that we've never been modern. His recent reflections concern the earth and the weather, in particular climate change. 
Slowly like by contrast that's facing Gaia, Fas and Gaia, we have different focus because the modernity that Slaughter Dive traces begins on a specific day, April 22, 1915, when a specially formed German gas regiment launched the first large scale operation against French Canadian troops in the northern Ypres salient using chlorine gas as their means of combat. You don't have to touch the enemy, you can kill them at a distance. After the First World War, this means of combat accelerates to and through World War II and the firebombing of Dresden, the nuclear attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, along with the deployment of weather control in Vietnam and so on. These days, the problematic force of this kind of weather weaponization lies in its standardization. On Solidex analysis, terror from the air corresponds to what is in effect an escalation uh, terms of the Pentagon, the multiplier of modern warfare action at a distance, the de facto norm for air battles, to quote Soderdijk, as a one-sided, irreciprocable airstrike. There's really nothing you can do, not at that moment, against the enemy. Today's ongoing wars, whether wars declared or not, are explicated in such a way, meaning always and ever, at our distance. To this extent, Sloterdijk takes a step beyond or apart from the rhetorical question concerning wars that do or do not take place, remember Jean Baudrillard, past, present, and future. The Sloterdijk frames this discussion with the militarization of weather in the third of his three volume spheres, spheres one, spheres two, spheres three, and the third is Schäumer, that's foam. And Luftbeben and in Quellen des Terrors on the sources of terror, here in this case from the air. Invoking Jacob Tauber's, there, there's Jacob, I took that photograph in Paris a long time ago. Uh, actually, uh, that would have been circa 85. With reference to Heidegger, and Adorno reminds us of Marinetti's celebration of what the Italian futurist calls the beauty of gas masks, made still more clearly with Sloterdijk's discussion of that same battle already mentioned, the Battle of Ypres, and the aesthetics of yellow foam, characteristic. And with COVID-19, we know a little too much about that fatal lung damage. To the same degree, Sloterdijk takes his points a bit further than we're accustomed to seeing in professors of philosophy who are usually, typically, fast students of convention. So, by talking about it in this way, the firestorm that Sloterdijk describes, that blast furnace effect is produced as the attackers aim to generate a fiery central vacuum by dropping a high concentration of incendiary bombs to produce a hurricane-like suction effect, a so-called firestorm. Fire takes oxygen, of course, as it burns. The result of these surgical, that's the language that was used at the time, bombing effects was the production of a special atmosphere capable of burning, carbonizing, desiccating, and asphyxiating at least 35,000 people in the space of a night, constituted, and that would have been the achievement at the time, a radical innovation in the domain of rapid mass killings. It's actually hard to do, so achievements like that are worth celebrating, and certainly that was done. But the same token, Hiroshima and Nagasaki are force multipliers of these same Dresden tactics. Thus is language of explication. As an articulation, as Adorno would have used similar terms, Sloterdijk takes the term just a little further to talk about the scandal of being in Heidegger's terms, taken now via Adorno to its dark limits. So the thus points to what radioactivity makes explicit. Think of an X-ray 
or think of the shadows that were cast on the volatilized bodies by the atom bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And by contrast, the insistence on repression, just not talking about it, or US occupation censorship, as he emphasizes, would entail that the mansion of even the deployment, the fact that bombs were dropped, etc., would be denied in Japan until 1952. Now, if you can deny an atom bomb for seven years, to deny chemtrails overhead in the sky seems easy by contrast. To this extent, silencing or suppression accompanies explication. To point here, we as consumers tend not to worry too much about microwaves, not to worry too much about cell phone radiation as we take our mRNA vaccines and munch our GMO apples and dine fine dining on GMO salmon, and so on. To the same degree, we may find that we face a radically new level of latency in Sloterdijk's terms. Now, Sloterdijk focuses on what he calls atmospheric explication. Current weather manipulation is included, of course, and has been since, and actually quite some time. So it's routine, if you point to such things for academics, especially academics, to deny these things, these facts, at last, as conspiracies, fake news, as if it were somehow an unquestionable article of faith that governments, our governments, would never be involved in such things as weather modification. Uh, I should say that this comes from the cover of Collier's uh, in 54, as said, but also May 28th. Now, Certainly, pointing to such a thing is problematic, given that, as Sloterdijk writes, built into the premises of weather weapons research is a stable moral asymmetry between U.S. acts of warfare and every potential act of warfare. Notice that if you see little sort of movements like that, you pretty much can tell that those are manipulated clouds. Under no other circumstances could there be, same thing here, anyway, to justify investing public funds in the construction of a technologically asymmetrical weapon of an evidently terrorist nature. Democratically legitimizing atmo terrorism in its advanced form requires a concept of the enemy that gives the use of means for the enemy's special ionospheric treatment an air of plausibility. So the next point concerns HARP. That's what we were looking at. Citing as already noted, the U.S. Department of Defense, that's available Freedom of Information Act, Owning the weather in 2025, it's pretty much coming up, in which the 1990s are named a decade of military escalation, which is not only previously unthinkable, but as Sloterdijk points out, largely unbeknownst to the public in the possibilities of atmo terrorist intervention, including the logical implication of the use of drone warfare under Obama and normalized as a Hollywood movie starring Helen Mirren, we already mentioned that this continues to this day. And Alan Rickman in one of his last films, I believe if you don't count the voice of the caterpillar, which quite far, this is the quote, from providing the antidote for terrorist practices, so that I argues, the stratification of weaponry works toward their systematization. The fact, he says, <clears throat> that the dominant weapon systems since World War II, and particularly in post-45 U.S. war interventions, are those of the Air Force, merely betokens the state terrorist habitus and the ecologization of warfare. By explaining that air design is the technological response to the phenomenological insight that human Notice the Heideggerian here hyphens being in the world is always a without exception present as a modification of even more Heideggerian being in the air at stake here is the state of what Heidegger called the question as questioning, transformed as a possibility in the wake of technology. If we need, as Sloterdijk argues, Adorno, meaning if we need critical theory to recall this possibility, we're still trying to catch up to the intersection in thinking that that would be to move between Heidegger and Adorno, as Sloterdijk maintains, it just in order to be able to explicate highly explicit procedures. To this extent, we can do this 
if we can think being in this way through critical theory, this would be Sloterdijk's post-phenomenology. Any thinking that stays phenomenological for too long turns into an internal watercolor in which, which, which in the best of cases fades in to non-technical contemplation. There's a little sarcasm and complexity right there. The new modern Prometheus. Now, Bernard Stiegler, we haven't uh, talked about him a great deal, except among other names mentioned, writes about technology and Prometheus, but he doesn't do this any more than does Gunther Anders, who had already emphasized the same ideal vision, quite as, going back to 1818, Mary Shelley had done in the alternate title or the modern Prometheus, her Frankenstein. Now, Mark Kirkleberg picks this up Obviously, we've mentioned this already when we were reading Kirkleberg in his new romantic cyborgs. Quite as technology is the engine of ambition, the promise of freedom. But it doesn't stop there because archaically, as the old myth tells the tale, we human beings were created. We were formed by Prometheus. Goethe tells the story as Nietzsche cites this in The Birth of Tragedy, whereby we humans are so many creatures of lightning. Blood and titanic ash were between the monkey and uh, the, the dog, as you can see. And obviously, I think this is meant to be a kind of lion with a human face. Formed by a maker, Omo Faber, Man the Maker, which is also the title of a novel by Max Frisch, I think you can see here. Also a film, obviously, with Barbara Sukawa and Sam Shep. Human being, named for making, takes this name over in his own name as his own best trademark. To this extent, the tool signifies raw human potential if you got the right tool for a particular job. Even for some, constituting the essence of the human, that's what we are, and that's the anthropological definition of technology, as Heidegger puts it, whereby quiet is going to Anders writes in a parallel with the Dorno's reflections on breath. We're ashamed that comes back one more time, but comparison with the perfection of the tool, the robot, the upgraded humanity 2.0, surely a second coming within our grasp. But we're warned. This is Adorno. There's no exit from the entanglement. The only responsible option is to deny oneself the ideological misuse of one's own existence. And as for the rest, to behave in private as modestly, inconspicuously, and unpretentiously as required in private, notice this, not for reasons of good upbringing, but because of the shame that when one is in hell, there's still air to breathe. Thus we dream. Not as Philip K. Dick's androids do of electric sheep, but to vary that same language. We dream as, not androids, but post-humans, trans-humans, beyond the human. To this extent, we've emphasized that Anders develops the notion when we were talking about Anders, we, we, we pointed to this. We feel a certain inadequacy by comparison with the gestel of the tool, the sheer idea of the tool and its constellation part and parcel. So remember the network of equipment, as Heidegger already writes in 1927 in Being and Time. This is Anders' Prometheus effect. As Anders first wrote, the Antiquiatite is mentioned in 1956, an effect since transmogrified almost utterly into transhumanism and the cargo cult aspirations of the same. Look what it will bring us. We hope to be able to do something with it, save the world, perhaps, or at least ourselves. Like Adorno, who raised the question of our complicity in genocide, Anders raised the question of our complicity in the ongoing violence, not just of genocide after genocide after genocide. Anders thinks there are many of these, but also of nuclear power plants, as these are, as the political theorist Langdon Winner, we read his The Whale and the Reactor, more prosaically argues, and Winner means the allusion to Clausewitz, the continuation of bombs by 
other means. Clausewitz's politics is the continuation of war by other means. But Mary Shelley's modern Prometheus was a creature fashioned of body bits of medical flotsam, mortuary, and cemetery detritus, a creature partly dead and partly alive, of what medical professionals still call proud flesh, insulted, inflamed. In stasis, the survivors of organ transplants are, for the rest of their lives, in stasis between necrotized dying tissue and still viable and consequently just for a little bit more functioning organs. The condition of necrotization and inflammation is the condition of any transplant. And the drugs one takes to prevent rejection of the organ are as much to prevent the body's re action, rejection of and to decay. In today's medical innovations, hearts and kidneys are decaying hearts and kidneys, lungs and livers from cadavers or humans kept in a quasi state of life just before death. Or non-humans if it's a xenotransplantation but above all skin even faces limbs it's significant that not unlike uh, shelley's early 19th century vision ridley scott's 1982 blade runner shows us a dark world of barely integrated cyborgs filthy urban landscapes uh, apartment building structure complete with ongoing rain and constant advertising holograms even if we haven't read a door, no, it doesn't matter because we live the culture industry, the consummate gestell of digital media, including the all-encompassing imaginary Lacan's words, that's the screen. In, in film and television series beyond the vistas of the bad future, we know the souk style kind of third and off-world markets of scavenged tech debris, presumed fetishized as valuable raw materials. That must be what's that's all about. Star Wars fans are redeemed by holographic projections. What's the diff? Robot lover, hologram lover, the same batek schema of rude warrior returns in Blade Runner 2049, where such is the market, capitalism itself turns out to be the sanctuary. Immune to both surveillance, that's a dream, provides the sanctuary. Immune to both surveillance, that would be Shoshana Zuboff's surveillance capitalism. So there's not really, this has to be a fiction because that's unlikely. Terror from the air and the separate corporation that's headed by Deckard's daughter, said to be supposedly with the prototype replicant, Rachel, Dr. Anna Staline. One almost needs, there she is, to add, as this very corporate security is secured by copyright, living in a bubble, safe from the air and its terrors, tech crafting custom memories, all terribly important. The differences exist just a tad today in the particular brand or make of the vaccine currently promoted and do a scheduled intensification called a booster because product updates are essential. Many of us are convinced that all we need to solve the problems of technology, of climate change, what have you, is simply the right tech, the right entrepreneur. Q, Elon Musk. And in my essay, maybe it's not, maybe it's someone else. But even scholars focused on technology and sociology of knowledge conversant with digital media seem unaware of the rather more prosaic bubble in which we live and on the terms of which we publish. Thus, it's not possible to buy anything online, but only what's available there. The internet's a closed bubble. In the same way, we saw this image before in an earlier discussion. We pretend it's 2017. A neem-inspired ghost in the shell offers a dystopian vision of full-body replacement. The conceit here is that only the brain needs to be transplanted to a 3D-printed body. I think in the future they'll laugh at us for thinking you could just cut right here and eliminate the spine. I think it will turn out you'll need that back section for everything to work. Now, there are other parallels We've pointed to these before in another video, but here we are with war technology. We dedicate our minds, ignoring the possibilities that those minds, our minds, can be subject to strictures of control, mind control, beyond the culture of industry, beyond advertising, and in any case, programming. 
of which pools or pr priming to use the other term we looked at. Culture industry, for Adorno, for Heidegger, and they both talk about this, can also include using a bit of music, a different kind of military air conditioning to use Kittler's language. As Sloterdijk takes the point to reflect that infrasonic waves affect not only inorganic materials, but also living organisms, in particular the human brain, which operates in these low frequency zones. HARP includes the prospect of developing a quasi neurotelepathic weapon capable of destabilizing the human population with long distance attacks on the cerebral functions. And that's pretty uncanny. Maybe we need to bring Heidegger and Adorno together, highlighting their shared focus on phenomenology and technology for the sake of a critique of reason, cynical and otherwise. And of course, Sloterdijk is the author of a critique of cynical reason. This climate change, and like Pogo, looking for the enemy, we ourselves are climate change. We are the cause, not to our carbon footprints, but through our manipulation of the weather. So not incidentally, but quite deliberately. If Anders, by Goethe, had already highlighted the problem of geoengineering with his discussion of the sorcerer's apprentice as Verschlimm Besserung, trying to improve things but making them worse, Sloterdijk clarifies that nowadays what human beings meet in the weather are their own expectorations, become atmospherically objective of their own industrial, chemotechnical, militaristic, locomotive, and tourist activities. Buried in the listing there of the uh, industrial, chemotechnical, militaristic, locomotive, and tourist, it's important to highlight militaristic. Describing the miasmatic air quality in public spaces near cemeteries, slaughtering yards, and cloacas, Schloderdijk foregrounds a certain consciousness, even <clears throat> broaching what he calls black meteorology, a chemtrail reference to be sure, including a theory of special man-made precipitations which deals with the way that aircraft unfold airspace and are deployed for atmosphere and power artillery purposes. Beyond Schloderdijk, we're still in the wake of modern technology and quiet as Heidegger reminds us we still need to ask after questioning. I thank you for your attention.